on. And welcome everybody to this question and answer and clarification session on how Evolute 6 is structured, what it means that we have a fair shares governance, shareholding, legal structure. You should all now be able to see my screen and see this um, PowerPoint on the screen. What I would suggest is that as we go through here, given that we have such a small number of people, if you have questions at any stage, feel free to interrupt and ask the question. Okay. So, why does Evolute 6 exist and why is it important that we have a, an, a legal structure that changes the game? If you think of today's world, we're looking at challenges at a global scale. What we're dealing with in the US right now with the flooding of Houston from Harvey is something mm -hmm. that's been clearly visible for a couple of decades, perhaps even since the Club of Rome report 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. We need to find better ways of coming together and dealing with these challenges, especially better ways for business to come together and deal with these challenges, given that business is part of the problem at the moment and it needs to be part of the solution. And as we'll see in a little while, part of the reason why business is more part of the problem and less part of the solution at the moment lies in the way that companies are structured legally. At the same time, we're facing problems at a very micro level. Many individuals are feeling overwhelmed, even down to people at school are feeling overwhelmed with the choices they need to make, how complex and fast changing life has become. The moral of the story is from the very individual personal level all the way up to the planetary level we're dealing with a need to increase our capacity to change what we do and who we are and make those changes faster than ever before and that's why evolute six exists we're clear that we wouldn't be able to do that if we weren't structured very differently to a traditional company <laughs> One of the reasons why so little change is happening in business lies in the fact that 13% of employees worldwide are actually engaged in their job. The rest of them are either retired on the job, they show up and earn their money, but they don't really put much effort into it, or even 24% are actively disengaged, which means actively sabotaging the work of their company. Yeah. We believe that a big contributor to this very low percentage of engagement and far too high percentage of disengagement lies all the way down to the way that companies are structured. The mm -hmm. nature of the share and all of that is something that fundamentally disempowers employees. <laughs> you can argue that employees in a traditional limited company are not far removed from the slaves of a century ago in the sense that they have no say in what happens to them long term. They can be bought if the shareholders of a company decide to sell all of their shares to a private equity company de facto all of the staff of the company are bought along with everything else mm. that is in many senses an abstract version of buying and selling a single live human being a hundred years ago as a slave on a sugar plantation mm. so again this points to why it's important to change not just what we put onto the walls of our companies as principles and values, not just change to 
collective ways, shared leadership, holocratic, sociocratic ways of governing, but to take that all the way down into the actual legal basis for governance it at an annual general meeting. Mm -hmm. Another reason why we need new company structures, I was talking to a client this morning and one of the themes of the conversation was that collaboration is the new innovation. <laughs> it's very much the case that in today's world, most of the work that is actually done in any large organization or any moderately complex activity is done by a large team of people and the most innovative work today is being done by networks rather than mm. any individual or any one company if you think of the most successful startups over the past 10 years many of them have been critically dependent on networks both networks in their user base as well as networks in their team the way that they operate their suppliers if you can call them suppliers it's mm. all network based yeah if 99 percent of the value of a company lies in a network that is not even inside the company again you need a completely different governance and legal basis for that company to truly function well. Mm -hmm. This actually takes us back mm -hmm. to the origin of the word company, which comes from the French, is the same origin as the word companion, which essentially means somebody who eats bread with you. Mm -hmm. So in essence, a company is about surviving and thriving as a group of people it's not about in its essence one group of people working really hard for a monthly wage in order to maximize the long-term total shareholder return for another group of people who exercise control and who have through that control the possibility of doing everything from developing that company over the long term with a generations perspective all the way through to asset stripping the company within a quarter for their own needs in the short term mm -hmm. so that takes us to evolute six we have mm -hmm. a very different share structure intended to address all of the above needs all of the above drivers pointing towards many of the problems that we're seeing in today's business world and on the planet have their origins very deep in the way that companies are structured mm -hmm. so the starting point to understand why evolute six has a very different legal structure is to understand what is the purpose of evolute six evolute six has a legally defined purpose which means that all of the agents of the company are legally obliged to serve this purpose mm -hmm. compare that with many companies where the purpose of the company is undefined which then mm -hmm. legally the purpose is de deemed to be maximizing total shareholder return in our case everybody is legally required to work towards this purpose. And the core elements of the purpose of Evolute 6 are to transform the way that business engages with people and the natural environment. Mm -hmm. So our purpose is to enable businesses and their people to flourish. The very clear business must flourish and the people in businesses must flourish. Mm -hmm. and benefits of developmental coaching and developmental organization design and practices to all the next important thing is to generate and spread well-being including but not limited to wealth and power amongst the company's mm -hmm. stakeholders and when we say the company's stakeholders we mean all stakeholders all of the different constituents 
that build up the companions that form the company. And all of this is intended, the very last line, to systemically improve the capacity of organizations to create environmental, human, social, and financial capital. <laughs> so that is um, the purpose of Evelyn Six. Mm -hmm. How we are structured and what we do at an organizational level, we have three distinct domains of activity. In green at the bottom is our work with individuals and groups of people to develop individuals as individuals or groups as groups. Just as in the past, everybody went to school and learned the three R's, reading, mm -hmm. writing, and arithmetic. We believe in the three R's will be complemented by a fourth discipline, the discipline of adult development or self-development as an adult. Mm -hmm. The second component of what we do is enabling organizations step towards becoming truly teal. That means, first of all, that everybody has mastered the practices of adult development that I referred to in the green segment, and that they are using at an organizational level those processes as well as self-governing or self-managing organization structures and processes, deliberately developmental processes, and ideally are also structured as a requisite organization. Requisite organization meaning the organization is as required by normal human beings to fully function as normal human beings. Most mm -hmm. organizations, sadly, are far from being requisite organizations. The final component of what Evolute 6 does is provide a source of financing and legal structures for such companies. The intent is to, in essence, reinvent the world of venture capital and private equity mm -hmm. by providing a source of money that fully recognizes the sh fair shares legal structures that we are currently using, mm -hmm. fully recognizes the importance of treating all of the different capitals equitably. Financial mm -hmm. capital obviously needs to be treated well and needs to get a fair return on investment. And equally, human capital and natural capitals also need to be treated equitably and we need to generate a fair share of the return on investment for those capitals as well. Mm. So, just very briefly, in the green, the individual development, we work in three different pillars, working on how people think through complexity. The middle pillar is how people engage with themselves and others in a complex, threatening world. And the final pillar is dealing with people's type, their makeup, things that cannot be changed easily. We do this in two different ways. One of them for people who do specific different units, you can get your badges or qualifications in that unit. The other way is people who engage with this as a long-term practice of self-development, we recognize the level you've reached in terms of belts of different colors. That gives an example of what we're doing at an organizational level, which in essence I've already covered. Um, the call mm -hmm. I came out this morning was one where I was working with a company to get their purpose clearly defined. That leads into defining strategy, which can lead into us helping companies find the right staffing. Structure as a requisite organization, bring in holacracy or sociocracy 3.0. Now, we dive into some of the details of the new company structure. If you look at the left diagram, the original idea of what a company existed for 
the job that a company did was to multiply financial capital. So you can think of the typical legal structure that companies use today is a tool that enables financial capital to be multiplied using as input people and raw materials and delivering mm -hmm. output products and waste. And if I'm a little bit nasty in my choice of words, those numbers from Gallup of only 13% engagement and the rest disengagement mm -hmm is pointing at 87% of the people in companies are in some sense waste product. Yes. It's no longer viable. Um, mm. So we believe that the companies of the future, especially a company that wishes to be good for the world, good for people and planet, it's still a tool to multiply capital only now it's a tool that multiplies all three capitals, financial, society, and environmental capital. No. To do that, it has to be circular. Is there a question? Nope, still going. Okay, goody good. So, if we want a company to multiply financial capital, social capital, and environmental capital, clearly the decision power vested in the votes of a share need to be accessible to all three capital, not just the financial capital. And the share of the wealth that is generated ought ideally to be shared between the investors of all three capitals, not just those investing financial capital. One way of looking at this is that what we're talking about is a separation now between past and future. The traditional share locks together past and future. <laughs> if you are voting about the future of the company, which is what I mean by the future, your right to vote is completely dependent on how much money you invested in the past. What we're saying here is we split those. Your right to engage in governance, decisions about how the company will evolve in the future, depends on your engagement with the future of the company on your being a constituent of the company and that is not necessarily hardwired to how much money you invested in the past or how much of any capital you necessarily invested in the past and there's a history to this this is actually nothing other than what nation states have done over mm. the past uh, couple of centuries. So nation states over the past couple of centuries have mm. shifted from a type of democracy where you only had the right to vote if you owned land in the country to mm. today's world where you have the right to vote if you are a citizen of the country. And what we're proposing here with the fair shares multi-stakeholder governance is exactly the same. Just as we shifted from a world where you needed land title in order to vote, we here in Evolut 6 are shifting from a world where you need a share of the financial capital to have the right to vote into a world where if you are engaged with the company as a good citizen, a constituent of the company in good standing, you have the right to vote. The essence of this means if the future of the company will impact your life in a significant way, you ought to have the right to speak at any general meeting 
and the right to exercise your vote in such a general meeting. Okay. This is not hard to do. You can also think of what we're talking about as at the moment, most companies are using one of a range of preset package deals, somewhat mm. like a package deal when you go on holiday, where you pay <laughs> money upfront and you get a set package deal in return for your money, and you don't need to engage in any other way. You just turn up at your uh, paid for hotel together with the other group of people, and you have your breakfast and your drinks and everything for free. You know, today's package deals might be the standard limited company, the cooperative, the trust, whatever the package deal is, there are a wide range. <laughs> However, there's no need for us to stick with those package deals. Package deals, by the way, that lock together past and future into a fixed way. We're quite at liberty to do a completely new type of share split rather than one that turns one share into say two shares with exactly the same properties but half the financial value here we're doing mm. a split where we're splitting the shares vertically we're separating out the right to vote and to share in the wealth of the company is separated from the rights to invest financially mm. So, before I dive into the details of how we've specifically done that, I open the floor now to Rory, and I will stop sharing on my side. Rory is the founder of the Fair Shares company, the Fair Shares concept, and I invite him if I can figure out yeah. how to stop sharing here to give us. I think I just start talking, don't I? <laughs> if I start talking, does my picture then uh, take center stage? No, your picture is still there, and I'm not quite sure what I've done, but I seem to be unable to stop sharing. Okay. Can other people hear you? Aha. Uh -huh. Somebody says, I can see you, Rory. Okay. Excellent. So whatever I've done is working now. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, Graham asked me just to spend five, ten minutes uh, talking about the history. Um, so um, I work at Sheffield Business School um, and I've worked there since 2003. And I undertook a doctorate on um, employee owned and cooperative models of business, specifically got interested in multi-stakeholder models. And those, the, the, the experience during those years that was most formative on me was visiting a group of uh, cooperatives in the uh, Basque region of Spain. Um, and they have what they call primary and secondary co-ops. And it was the secondary co-ops that were particularly interesting, the bank, the university, and also the retail chain that spreads across Spain, because they all had multi-stakeholder structures that were working extremely effectively. So it persuaded me that, um, in the English speaking world, we haven't really properly engaged with multi stakeholder work around, well, multi stakeholder structures with a significant degree of employee ownership. So we, we ran summer schools for about five years where we were teaching these multi stakeholder structures to consultants, to academic staff, to people that uh, get called social entrepreneurs. And after about four or five of these years, we started introducing a learning activity where the students had to design their own fair shares model. Um, and out of that learning activity, we formed an association with some of the students, and that, that association has now been constituted as a company in the UK. So we have an association, and um, the work of the members of the association uh, attracted the interest of uh, partners in Europe. So there are uh, six, six partner organizations in a, a European project now, and they are now all creating incubators for the fair shares model, we call, we call the fair shares model. Um, so what I'll do is just very briefly show you the way that we represent a fair shares model. 
Now, to do this, I need to share my screen. So I think the one I was going to use, right. So at university, can you see my screen now? Perfect. I, yeah. Uh, just try and make that full screen. So we, at, at the university, we now have a, a special research centre that we call the Fair Shares Institute that is working with these European partners. And, and we present the Fair Shares model as a way of eliminating poverty and promoting social justice. Um, and the Institute is specifically charged with testing and developing the Fair Shares model and helping people apply it in practice. Um, this is a diagram that we use quite a lot. We, we imagine that a company develops from the founders outwards. So uh, Graham has obviously started you know, Evolute 6. Um, and in order for his company to work, he needs to attract people who will help him develop the products and services that will be offered by that company. There might be people who are interested in those products and services, but it's not until those products and services have been made available by whoever provides the labour that you get a user community. And we use the word users generically for anybody who uses the products and services of a company. Uh, in practice, they may be customers or they may be clients or they may be patients, they might be tenants, they will put different labels on them, but you have a user community. And, and most research shows that the investment community uh, only comes in later when you have a, a relatively inexperienced entrepreneur. If you've got an entrepreneur with a track record, they might join them at the start of the venture. But in many cases, people start up their own ventures, they find it very, very hard to find anybody who will invest money in their venture. So this is the development pattern that we take for granted, but we, we put the argument that you need all of these four stakeholder groups to make a, a company successful. So the, the, the half of fair shares is that you recognize your founders, your workforce, and your user community as members, and you admit them to membership of the organization. And any of those three groups might also invest financial capital, and they might open up financial capital um, investment to uh, other stakeholder groups if they constitute themselves as a cooperative or a company. So you have one class of share that recognises the financial contribution and you have three classes of share that recognise the entrepreneurship, the labour process and the user community or the customer community that sustains the business. And Graham's constituted Evolutric, uh, Evolute 6 as a company but we've been working to develop these principles across any legal module, model that we think supports mutuality. So companies, cooperatives, partnerships and associations can all be set up as an essentially an association of members. So that's why we work with those four legal models. Um, the only other thing I think I'd just like to share with you is the, the basic values and principles that have been adopted by the Fair Shares Association. Um, by the Fair Shares Institute at Sheffield Business School and also by the Fair Shares Partners in the, the European project. So we, we try to develop business development processes that focus on wealth sharing, um, defining social purpose. I, I, Graham is saying he's just been the company to help them define their purpose. And once they have a purpose, auditing uh, their success in achieving that purpose then focusing on the goods and services that are offered, that these goods and services do produce well-being, which um, Evolute 6 is, is committed to doing, but also that you produce them and you retail them in a way that is good for the labour force and for your customers. So it's not just about what products you offer, it's the way you produce them and the way that you retail them and you distribute them. And then the last is the issue of democracy, which uh, uh, Graham has been pointing out about. We, we call it the, you know, it's the extension of the social democratic model into firms and companies. So democratic ownership, governance and management um, and to create an inclusive culture. So I'd be happy to take any questions you have on any of that and uh, can direct you to additional resources if you so wish. So, yeah. Am I back in the screen now? Or are we looking at you, Greg? <laughs> you're, you're back in the screen. I can see you clearly. Um, probably when I'm talking, other people see me. Okay. Good. Any questions to Rory at this point?
Okay. Uh, I what, yeah, I, I do have a, I do have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. It's uh, so. How do I didn't really get how the investors come with uh, so uh, yeah. I didn't really understand like yeah the role of the investors apart from bringing money. It sounds to me like they don't have a say in in how the the, the company is is run. Is that correct? No, they they have exactly the same voice rights as the other stakeholder groups. So, um, in the model constitutions that we've done, whatever whatever speaking rights, whatever resolution rights, whatever voting rights um, belong to okay. one. The other classes have the same rights. So okay, so it's more like it's distributed to investors, but also to the yes. rest of the stakeholders. Okay. Yes. Um, we do. We have provisions for weighted voting where people want it, but the the underlying premise is one shareholder, one vote, mm -hmm. which is actually something that existed at the very beginnings of of the company legal form. It was much. It was very common in the 19th century to have one shareholder one vote rather than one share one vote and it was the legal it was the accounting profession and the that changed the norm to one share one vote in order to help the richer shareholders okay thank you rory i, I wasn't actually aware of that last bit that it had been the accounting profession that changed the the nature of corporate governance uh, so, uh, if, according to uh, an article in Business History that we, we, we read while we were developing one of our academic papers on fair sharing, so, um, yeah, it was the, that was the, the claim of the historian who wrote that paper. Yes, yeah, there's something a bit sad about people who have very little to do with governance who get involved in transforming the, the governance of a company. Yes. Right. Any other questions or shall I continue with the specifics? You know, you, you've set us up very nicely for that, for me to continue with the specifics of how we've set up the difference between voting, weighting and profit sharing and wealth sharing. Yes. Right. I will put everybody else onto mute and start screen sharing. So share screen you should all now see the slideshow and we move on from rory so as you will have imagined from what rory said and perhaps rory i should redo my slides now so that they look much more like yours we also have the different classes because we're a limited company and in particular because we have the intent of having long-term very large numbers of users possibly not so many investors and an unknown number of people who we will be in labor we've made the choice of weighting each of the voting groups so what that means is it's still one person one vote but the vote is exercised in in the class and it's weighted then according to that class weight so for example at the moment the investor class has a weight of 12. what i mean by future weight when you are voting about the future of the company that is the amount of power your vote has in the investor class which is 12 percent of the total vote the users also when voting about the future of the company have a weight of 12 percent at the moment the labor class has a vote of 13 percent and at the moment the founder class has a weight of 63 percent over time as the company matures the voting weight of the founder class will decrease down to 26 percent the voting weight of labor will increase to 26%. The user and labor voting weight will both increase to 24%. The rationale behind that is that when a company is very young, it's critically important that the company stays 
true to its purpose. Quite often that purpose is not even clearly understood. It's something that is more in the gut instinct of the founders. The values of the company are often tightly embedded in the values of the founders. So this enables the founders to maintain sufficient influence in the company in the very early phases until the essence of what the company really stands for has become sufficiently clear that everybody in the company, all of the constituents, are clear on what the company stands for. It's something that is in many senses akin to the role of a guardian or a parent in bringing up a child, taking care of the development of somebody until they've reached a point of maturity where they are, have the capacity to fully understand what's happening and choose wisely for themselves. The flip side of what we're talking about is how do you share in the past wealth? Now, to make sure that the founder or the, the, the holders of the founder share are not at risk of being sidetracked from their core purpose of starting up the company and keeping it true to purpose, the founder shares, whilst they carry a very high voting weight, carry zero capital gain and only a 1% share of the dividend. Unlike, for example, the investors bottom right, where they share 50% of the capital gain and 35% of the dividends. Labor and user, each of them share 25% of the capital gain and that should actually, I think, be 25% of the user for the dividend and 40% of the dividend for labor. So what that's saying is that the three classes of shares that invest significant amounts of capital, investors investing financial capital, labor and user who are investing social capital or human capital, they share the bulk of the output of the company. They share the bulk of the wealth. As Rory said, anybody can hold shares in any of these classes. So for example, I hold investor shares, labor shares, and founder shares. So I do share in the capital gain of the company through my financial investment in the company. I share capital gain through my investment of human capital, time, intellectual property, relationships. So I do still have a significant share in the wealth generated of the company, but that is a share based purely on how much have I contributed to generating that wealth of the company. It's not a function of my simply happening to have been the first person in the starting blocks giving me some sort of de facto rights of a king who just happens to have been born owning the whole country. But I retain the stewardship power to make sure that the company matures in a wise way for as long as is necessary. Now in the shares there are, sorry, in the constitution of the company, there are specific milestones where the voting weight of the founder decreases and the weight of the other three classes increase. So that is, as it were, programmed in. And somebody who's doing this now or perhaps in a year's time might end up programming that in in the form of a smart contract on a blockchain or something like that. This entire approach lends itself supremely well to the blockchain and to smart contracts 
as a way of actually automating and guaranteeing that the governance works correctly. So one of the things I mentioned was that any individual can so, have... Graham, I had yeah. a question. Sorry, I was writing in the chat box. So if you could go to the previous slide, please, yes. So you said, um, say, an individual can be in multiple pockets, right? So in that case, if it's a one stakeholder, one vote, how does one, how does that um, work if you have your foot in three different doors? Ah, perfect mm -hmm. question, which sends me up for the next slide. Okay, sorry, thank so, you. <laughs> one vote, but only in the highest share category you own. So given that I have a founder share, I can only exercise my vote in the founder category. I cannot exercise it in the investor category or the user category or the labor category. You, for example, Nikki, you have a labor share. Um, you could also have an investor share. Because you have a labor share, you're only allowed to vote in the labor category. This is, this by the way, is not something that is hardwired into the fair share concept overall. The way that most fair shares companies do it, at least this was the way when I talked to Rory a year ago, is that they allow you to exercise your vote in all of the categories you're in. Um, Rory, perhaps you'd like to comment on that at this point? Yes, in terms of the uh, the model rules that are available, you're right. We haven't, we don't insist um, on um, the the model that you've got. But when we role play, when we when we do teaching materials and we role play governance and voting, we ask people to vote in the category that they joined first. So we actually do role play it in much the same way. Um, that you do, but it, it's by your first connection to the business. Um, we do have spreadsheets that enable you to, you know, work out what the weighting vote would be if people did vote in more than one category. But I'm inclined to agree with you that in practice, it's quite useful to have a system like this. It makes the running of meetings much easier. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. Also, I think that there's there's something in if you're voting in multiple categories, that opens up a route to different people having different numbers of votes. If somebody has four shares, then in a sense they're voting four times in a meeting rather than just once. Yeah, we, we talked to the, the regulator of cooperatives in the UK and, and he, he, he didn't see it as a major problem. If, if I, for example, was a member of different cooperatives that were all members of a, well, a secondary co-op. So in the UK, we have Co-ops UK, and I might belong to several co-ops that vote on something as members of Co-ops UK. But actually, when you're running a frontline business that's producing goods and services, and you're taking decisions about strategy and the future, I think it's sensible to um, organize it the, the way that you're doing it is that people vote in one category only. Yeah. Yes, I, this, this has been our sense that it was wiser to, to really keep it strictly one person, one vote. And mm -hmm. we look at it rather than as the category you come into first, as the category that you are currently most strongly engaged with the company through. Yes. Um, I, I, uh, as you know, I, I'm quite supportive of what you're doing here. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. So the, the one thing I'll add in here at this point, you mentioned the whole question of the executive work. Keep in mind that this is the voting rights in a general meeting context, which is mm -hmm. about the long term decisions about the, the long term future of the company. Mm -hmm that is an executive role which is your normal work of the leaders of the company the management of a company just as in any standard listed company or 
unlisted limited company where the shareholders leave all of that to the management team of the company. Exactly the same here. All the day-to-day -day executive decisions in the company are done by the management team, in particular because we are running on Sociocracy 3.0. All the day-to-day -day decisions on how to execute some role in the company, how to do your work, are done by the people who are directly doing that work. And the, this voting has got nothing to do with that whatsoever. Now, that is also points at one other thing where we are slightly different, um, only slightly to many of the other companies using fair shares. Because we're using Sociocracy 3.0 as our operating system in all day-to-day -day work, We've also extended that up into how we initially attempt to reach decisions um, in general meeting formats. Um, Rory, I, could you mute? Yes. Thanks. Um, so when we're having a general meeting trying to take some tough decision about the future of the company, we first of all do our best to take that decision using a sociocracy consent process, which means we ask people, do they completely agree with what's proposed? Do they disagree with it because they have some concrete reason why they believe it could actually be harmful for the future of the business and a way of addressing that harm or are they in between? They neither fully agree with it, but nor do they see any reason why it would be too dangerous to even try. So with that kind of consent decision-making, it means that we are able to tap into what any individual member of the company from any of the segments might have as an insight into how a certain course of action or choice for the future might cause irreparable harm to the company, harm that is so big that even trying it might put the whole company at risk for everybody. And of course, that gives us significantly more intelligence when we're taking big decisions than any traditional company can ever have. So often in the voting of a traditional company, because it's only the investors who are involved in voting, and it's a simple kind of democracy, the risk that the one person who has unique insight into why a certain course of action will be harmful, the risk that that person gets swamped in all of the other noise and not listened to is very high. In this way of working, it doesn't matter how small the warning light is. If there's a warning light flashing a warning that your choice may cause irreparable harm for the company, that warning light will be listened to. At the same time, typically in a consent process, you rapidly get to a point where there are no objections, i.e., we should not do this because it is quite likely to cause irreparable harm. However, if in that consent process, we come to a point where we're unable to move forwards, that's when we bring in voting. Um, once all of the objections have been listened to and the um, perception is that the objection is actually not one that is likely to cause fatal harm, that's when we would switch into voting. Or in something, for example, where it is about a legal change to the constitution of the company or something like that, that's also where we would use voting to make sure that we have real clarity on 
where everybody stands. So in that sense, you can think of voting in some ways as being the less preferred option. The most preferred option is a sociocratic consent or governance round where all of the insight that the entire group of people have into the risks and advantages is taken into account. We have a third layer as a final backup. In the event that there is any kind of dispute that cannot be resolved using a sociocratic process, nor by simple democratic governance, the final stage is then binding mediation through ACAS. So again, here we're doing every attempt, as Rory described, to make sure that this is something that is serving the health of our social capital from start to finish, minimizing the types of things that we might do that would split people apart, that would harm the social capital. So let me go on to a couple more things. How do you acquire the right to vote as a labor or user shareholder? For the investor, of course, it's quite simple. You get an investor share by simply paying money. Invest money in us and you get that number of investor shares. And the investor shares, you can buy as many as you want you can sell them to whoever you want at whatever price is agreed. You can even leave them to other people in your will. You can inherit them or whatever. The user shares, it's only one share per person, and you forfeit on ceasing to qualify as a user. Labor shares, it's one share per person, and you forfeit the share on ceasing to qualify as a labor shareholder or it may get converted to a user share if you subsequently qualify for user shares. Neither the labor nor the user shares can be bought, sold, inherited, etc. The founder shares are restricted to the founders and they are forfeit when the founder leaves the company. So again, they, you can see, are very tightly constrained can only be used to exercise a kind of in loco parentis role in the company. The qualifying criteria for user shares that we propose is that you're a paid up member, that you've qualified to yellow belt. In other words, you actually have grasped the processes that we use and that you are qualified in the governance process. These three are also, in a sense, a proxy for being sufficiently strongly committed to future engagement with the organization. The qualifying criteria to share in the wealth generated as a user shareholder is that you've contributed human capital of some nature such as intellectual property, time, leads, relationships, clients, sparring beyond what is needed for grading, community building, that you've contributed something to the overall success of Evolute 6. Those contributions are tracked, and then at the end of each year, whatever wealth may have been generated will be shared out in proportion to the capital contributed. Similarly for labor shares, the proposal at the moment is you qualify for labor shares if you are a significant regular contributor with the expectation of some form of remuneration, that you have accountability for one or more defined roles in the sociocratic governance structure we're using, that you are engaged with at least a minimum of 20 hours per month of recognized contribution, um, excluding governance meetings. And that, of course, your financial and human capital given and received is being tracked. And there's also a requirement that you've passed whatever probation conditions may be in force at the time. And then the 
qualifying criterion to share in the wealth generated very much as before that you've contributed human capital of some nature such as intellectual property time leads relationships clients sparring beyond that needed for grading community building etc so those are the proposed criteria um, in terms of those two any questions on the qualifying criteria as a user and as it, stephanie for example you're one of the users in the call um Bannard and nikki are two of the labor shareholders in the call any questions on either of those i i have a question yes um, d does that mean it is it's possible to um qualify for profit share without qualifying for voting in effect in effect or is it that the second right is over and above? You get the second right once you've met the first set of qualifying criteria for membership. That, that is something that is part of what we're prototyping at the moment. You're actually right. The way that this is proposed, somebody who joins the company contributes a significant amount of um human capital mm -hmm. but hasn't yet reached a point of qualifying to vote mm. might have a share of the wealth without yet having a share of the vote okay my suspicion though is that that will be relatively rare although it might happen for instance somebody might come to us attend two sessions of the 16-week program mm -hmm. and have brought in with and, and decide to bring in a client that generates significant wealth already in the next four weeks which might be just before the general meeting or the the cutoff point where wealth is being shared in a situation mm -hmm. like that, whilst the individual might not yet have met the qualifying criteria for voting, they certainly ought to share in a fair share of the wealth they've generated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'll mute myself. Please. And I have a question about like, what do you call the qualification and governance processes? Ah, so that means that you have some understanding of how a sociocratic governance round is done and what we intend to do is run simple trainings in how does a sociocratic governance process work which won't take anybody more than about probably half an hour to an hour of either listening to one of us explain it or watch it on video and then in the actual AGM to stay with what the facilitator is leading us through during the actual decision-making process. So, so mm -hmm. I think it answers my question. So is that the right understanding that since I'm, I'm a paid up member and I'm, I have qualified for a yellow belt, and if I do that training, then I qualify for voting. Yeah, absolutely. You are almost completely qualified to vote. And what we, whilst we haven't yet run an annual general meeting, what we will undoubtedly do is run one of those governance trainings in the hour before the meeting actually starts formally. Okay. Any other question on either of these slides? Right, in that sense, jumping on, we have one other area where we are different to a standard fair shares company. Remember that our purpose is to, in 
enable organizations function as requisite organizations to enable organizations step towards teal and one of the elements of a requisite organization is that individuals have sufficient complexity of thinking to grasp the complexity of the role they have and sufficient maturity in how they engage with themselves and how they interact with other people to be up to the maturity demands of the role they have. And so we've built into our criteria for the senior most officers of the company, the requirements of a requisite organization that we ourselves eat the food that we are serving to our clients. And that means that to be a member of the board or part of the executive, that you need a dialectic fluidity of at least 20. In other words, your complexity of transformational thinking has reached a sufficiently high level to grasp what is happening. And that you have at least reached what's called Keegan stage S4 brackets three, which is a complicated way of saying that you are close to defining yourself who you really are rather than somebody who still defines who they are on the basis of belonging to a certain group. In other words, that you've become self-authoring. And again, that's something which is where we're bringing together concepts from the world of Teal and deliberately developmental organizations together with the concepts of fair shares and democratic company structures from Rory's world. Um, and I've already mentioned that voting is first three S3 consent, failing that way go to weighted voting. For many of the big changes, like changes to the constitution, we require a supermajority of 75%. And there are also aspects of the company where whilst it's structured as a cooperative on a limited company basis, we also have elements of community interest companies or trusts or nonprofit organizations where we have an asset lock. For example, on bankruptcy, assets can only go to similar organizations. And we have a few other elements that really make the Eblut Six share structure a combination of the good things of a standard for-profit limited company, along with the good things of a cooperative, along with the good things of a community interest company. In many senses, this is about changing the rules of the game for how companies engage with all of their constituents and the world so that companies truly can become a force for good for people and planet. Right, so that is the end of this bit. Um, I will now hopefully open up the pictures again. Right, we're back to the pictures. We're at 10 past 11. We've gone through quite swiftly, hopefully not too swiftly. Where are you? Um, <laughs> I'm in not UK. Ten, it's not 10 past 11 where I am. <laughs> <laughs> where are you, Stephanie? I'm in Denmark. Denmark. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm in... So it's 11 past, it's 10 past 8 here. Right. What did I say? Ten past, Ten past eleven. Oh, it's terribly sorry. <laughs> it's, it's when I said that it was, I guess, te eleven minutes past nine. Okay. <laughs> uh, I just got it completely wrong. Right. It's eleven minutes past nine. So I'm in Brussels right now. Okay. Um, could I, when you um, finish this, is it possible to share this video with my Shares Labs partners? Absolutely. I will um, send the video up to you. Okay. They'd really appreciate it, I'm sure.
Um, and we had to write some best, best practice cases. So I could write a, a, brief, a, a, a briefing around the way that you would have the model, uh, which I've already done for that book chapter, but this would be much shorter. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you, Rory. Let's, let's lock arms like a, a good rugby scrum and continue to <laughs> move this whole fair share stuff forwards. Indeed. Yeah. Um, so are you based in uh, Belgium now? I am based, I'm basing myself partly in Belgium and partly in London now. I'm okay. finding significantly more traction for what we're doing on the continent. So yes. I a decision three months ago to begin the process of shifting my residence to Belgium and mm. commute once a month or so from Brussels to London rather than what I was doing, which was commuting more and more often from London to the continent. Yes. Well, that, there is a, um, there is an associ a research association that's um, the formal part of the organization is registered in Brussels. Um, so um, I will. Uh, we're institutional members of that association, and they they would be. I mean, they will find out what about what you're doing because we're going to host their conference in 2019. So I guess I want to put on your agenda, maybe coming and doing something at the conference in 2019, and then I could introduce you to this network of researchers, which are hosted mainly from Belgium. Yes, it's a global network, but Belgium is the heart. The, uh, the, the two key researchers are at Liège and Louvain. Excellent, excellent. No, I would yes. love that. I would love that. Yes. Um, and perhaps it, it may be worth connecting me with them sooner rather yes. than later. There may yep. be something that I'm doing that is relevant to their research work. Well, if I do come over in November, then we could maybe arrange that, yeah. Yes, excellent. Okay. Let's plan that. Good. I don't want to get in, in the way of it. I, I think I'm, I'll have to leave you now. Uh, I need to go and join my family. So um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your meeting and I look forward to catching up with the last bit of video. <laughs> excellent. Yeah. Thank, Thank you me. very much. So all the best to all of you. Bye, Nick. Bye, Bye. 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 Right. So. From the three of you, any other questions or comments or anything that you want to bring in? Not from my side, Grant. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, well, there is one comment from my side. Um, uh, you made a comparison with democracy in the state. And uh, my suspicion is that uh, in, in the state, we also have now attempts to 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 open doors for participative democracy uh, but as we know very few members really participate uh, and only those and those who participate are m most often the best qualified and best educated persons and not those who have the worst living conditions um, and my suspicion is that we really need to make sure that that the same does not happen with this structure, that also only a few participate and uh, and the majority just doesn't understand the system and therefore does not um, make use of their rights. Yes. So my question is, how can we make it really easy? Yes. To, to it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think we maybe we can learn a lot from from Mondragon and and um, maybe Morningstar and and other organizations who really have also um, laborers laborers who who do not have a good education. Yes, completely mm. agree. It needs to be much much easier than it is at the moment. It needs to be something where everybody whose future is tied up with the future of Evolute 6 is fully able to engage and able to contribute everything that they have to contribute. Mm. Yeah. 
And the other comment is that I think that S4 slash 3 is, is too low. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm with you on that. I think that S4, sorry, it's S4 brackets 3, which is one stage higher. Um, I suspect okay. that over time that will migrate towards S4 or S4 brackets 5 and the dynamic yeah. fluidity of perhaps 30 and heading up to 40 or 50 even as we go. I yeah. was thinking that at the moment in the startup phase, if we had the criterion for the executive higher than it is now, um, <laughs> there, there might not be enough people to actually do it. Okay, <laughs> I see what you mean. You know, it's, the, the, d depending on which assessment is being done of me, um, I, I might not be much higher than S4 at the moment, <laughs> or S4 brackets three when I founded it four years ago. So it would be quite unpleasant for me to define the, the criteria in such a way that I'm not allowed to contribute. <laughs> okay. I, I doubt the assessment, of course. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, no, you, you're oh. quite right there. Yeah. Um, thank you from my side. Only a pleasure. Um, Stephanie, any questions from you? <clears throat> Not now. Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm the type who needs to digest. So I've, ta I've taken notes and I found that it was really interesting. And questions might come later. But uh, overall, it was, yeah, I just thought it was very interesting. I know absolutely nothing about like all the sociocracy and holocracy apart from like the name and the high level concept that it's very participative but so it's um yeah i'm, I'm starting from scratch but it's, it's very uh it's very enlightening and, and and interesting excellent thank you stephanie well i have one question to go back to all of you which is having listened to all of this please put your thinking hats on we're soon going to start looking for investors. And if you know of somebody who is interested in transforming how the economy works, interested in making a difference to the world, who would align themselves with our core purpose and with the fair shares way that we're bringing that purpose to life, um, those are the kinds of people that we are soon going to be looking for. So no answer needed now, but keep that thought in mind and keep your eyes and ears open for people like that. Wonderful. Well, thank you everybody. If there are no more questions, I will stop the recording. Mm -hmm. Right. Um. My question would be, if you offer consultancy, uh, if an organization wants to shift their structure. Yes, we do offer consultancy. Um, we offer consultancy across the full spectrum of the three areas that I said, including consultancy on how to bring in a fair shares legal structure as well as, of course, consultancy on how to structure the organization, organization design, strategy, evolutionary purpose, deliberately developmental organization, etc. Yeah. And depending on the exact nature of the request, we might do it ourselves with our own internal people, or we mm. will work with a, an appropriate partner for example, if we're doing something on the legal structure in um, mm. Austria, we may well work mm. a, at the final stage with a legal expert on Austrian company law as part mm. of the process. And does it make sense to shift to fair shares without integrating S3 or holacracy? I, I certainly believe it does. Um, most of the companies that Rory is working with have introduced a fair shares legal structure without using 
a sociocratic way of operating. Okay. Um, my sense is it doesn't actually matter where you start. I think if you do fair shares, sooner or later you're going mm. to come across sociocracy or holacracy and begin using that because it, it just makes sense to do them together. They, they go so well together. Okay. It opens a lot more doors in my head now. Thank you. Excellent. Very, very glad about that. Thank you, Bernard. Any other questions? No, thank you. Mm. Bernard? Yes, I'm satisfied for today. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Bernard. And Stephanie? No more question for today. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, this